If you saw when you came in, we were having our fall kickoff, even though it is still really hot. <laughs> I know if you're Illinois, you started school last week. Can I get a hallelujah? Woo! All right, if you're like me, and we don't start till this Wednesday, 
we're a little bit sad, but we're still so thankful, right? I love my kids, but it's been a good summer, and it's been a good summer, but we are ready. Um, just for that transition into fall, um, I'm sure you saw it as you come in, as you came in, we have all the tables of all of our life groups happening, and any place that you would be able to get connected to serve. So welcome again, and welcome to our online people. Hey, friends, tell us where you're at, and give us a shout. Um, and as we dig into service, would you pray with me? God, we just thank you so much for who you are and for allowing us into this place today. God, we pray for our country. We pray for our world. Uh, we pray for all of the leaders making decisions, and we pray for families grieving loss today. So God, as we have the opportunity to just step into your presence today, may you just bless our time together. We love you. Amen. smoke or mirrors cause I know there's a God who's real I don't need the lights to fool me cause I've seen the God who heals I know when I ask I receive it cause you're not a God who withholds I hear you say just believe me I need a holy ghost awaken in my soul Love and words that are in my bones till the evidence show. I need a holy ghost awaken in my soul. I need a heart on fire that will never grow tired.
If you have been to the point before and your kids are checked in, it's time to go. If you are visiting today or it's the first time your kids have wanted to attend the classes in the back, please see someone at the back corner here and they will help you check in your kids. Guys, it's a very secure system. Um, they will have a sticker and there's all security in the hallway at all times. We just have a really good um, system back there and we would just love to have all the kids move that way. It is move up week. So that means if whatever grade your kids just started or are going to start this week because they haven't started yet, uh, that's where they will go. Fifth and sixth graders are meet at what we call the bridge, and it's out the doors and to the left. All right, if you are a parent of a 7th through 12th grader, this week kicks off our alternative group. It's right. Uh, abbreviation is ALT. We have uh, Miss Sarah Martin who is overseeing that. It starts this Wednesday at 7.06. Yes, you heard me right. I had to look at that like three times. And call somebody and say, is it really 7.06? It is 7.06. And when you talk to Sarah and find out why, it's really kind of a cool little thing. So if you have students, please prepare to send, send them. Did I say send? Like sending is always a really wonderful thing. It makes it sound like an electric. I love my kids, but I love it when they get to go. So Sarah will be in the foyer after services if you have questions about that. All right, meet and greet online. This is really important for you as well. Please participate. I would like to know for today, what is your favorite vacation spot ever? And especially you guys online, make sure you put it down. I'm taking notes for next summer. Enjoy, guys. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Yeah. There's some energy in the room with three of you. Yeah. I'm glad you guys are here. My name's Tim Bycroft. Um, I, who was able to get some of that breakfast casserole this morning? Anybody? Yeah. So if we clap loud enough, maybe they'll do that like every week. Tom, Mary, Vic, Bev. Yeah. <laughs> They're sitting back there going, mm -mm. Uh. <laughs> All right, well, I'm glad you guys are here. Let me, let me start by asking a question. How many of you, like seriously, you have, you know, the bucket list thing, the, the things you want to do before you kick the bucket type of thing? How many of you have a bucket list? Some of you, not many of you. You know, what's funny is I'm looking out here, and the people who raise their hands are my age or older. There's a reason for that. Yes. You guys are old. Um, and so, you know, the, the older we get, the more that those types of things kind of become important to us. As a matter of fact, I was just, this week I was thinking about this, and, and you know that they actually have apps out there to help you uh, manage your bucket list. 
That's, that's just where we are. We, we have apps for your phone that can just help you manage your bucket list. Now, I keep mine in my mind. I, I know what I like to do. I'm not much of a commercialized guy. I don't like to necessarily go to big cities. Uh, you know, Disney World, those kind of things have no draw for me. They're, none of those are on my bucket list. Okay, um, I'm, I'm more like, uh, I'm going to go deep sea fishing. I'm going to go kayaking with whales. I want to do something, four-wheeling in the mountain. I want to do some of these things. And, and actually, here's the cool part. Um, things that were kind of like on my bucket list, if you will, I've actually been able to do. Some of those things are great. Some of those I've had a lot of fun with. We just got back a few weeks ago from a trip to Alaska. It was amazing. See, people ask me how it went, and I'm like, I had expectations of what Alaska was going to provide. It succeeded and exceeded my expectations. It was amazing. I absolutely loved it. Now, so let me ask you, how many of you who do have some type of bucket list, and let's not call it a bucket list, you've got wishes, you've got dreams, you've got things that you've wanted to do in this life, how many of you had a dream and you were able to do it? Or you had a bucket list, you were able to do it? Some of you need to get out more. It's like four people like. So either some of you have little expectations of what life's going to bring, or some of you just need to go and do it. I don't know what it is. But you know this. You know this. Um, you know that life isn't just one bucket list after another, is it? Well, life isn't one just massive ride or vacation day after another, Right, Because you do a bucket list thing. You, you do this thing that you've wanted to do for a long time. You, you finally saved the money for it or you had the time to do it or the situation was just right for you to be able to accomplish it. And so you go and you do it and then what? Like, yeah, I did it. That was awesome. Bought the t-shirt, you know. It was good. But then it's over. Right? And so we look for the next thing because... That's what we want. We're, we're looking for that excitement. However, we know, again, the bucket lists aren't every day. As a matter of fact, day, uh, in, day in and day out, life is more like, you know, this daily grind that we kind of have to do. Whether you're a parent, whether you're an employee or a boss or whatever, um, it, it doesn't matter. We have things that we have to do, and it becomes, to some degree, the daily grind, right? There's the daily grind that we find ourselves in. And the problem with the daily grind is if you're anything like me, if you're in the daily grind doing the same thing day in, day out, all of a sudden you start to feel a little empty. <coughs> you may be doing things. You may be accomplishing things. You may be fulfilling job descriptions or parenting, you know, duties or whatever, but sometimes in the middle of the grind of the day-to-day, -day, all of a sudden, we can just kind of feel empty, can't we? I'm not the only one in here that knows this. There's kind of like this, our soul kind of starts to feel empty. Maybe apathy starts to creep in. And so what I want to do today is talk about that. What do we do when we start to feel empty? Apparently, this section right here really needs to hear it. Okay, what do we do when our souls start to feel empty, okay? Our physical bodies, think about this for just a second. Our phys physical bodies, let's think about this for just a second. When you've been, when you get dehydrated or when you get thirsty, what do you do? You drink, right? Have you ever been to a point where you're just like really dehydrated? I mean, just like the fluids are leaving your body faster than you can put the fluids in. Have you ever been there? It makes you sick, it, may, it makes you weary, your mind starts to play tricks on you. It's, it's not really, I was in Haiti a few years back and uh, we were working on this project. It was hot, man, it's Haiti, imagine that. It was hot and we were working and all, all of a sudden, I'm just like, man, I do not feel good. And, and, and here's the thing, I'm fat and out of shape. I just thought I was fat and out of shape. All right, you know, I was like, man, I hope that amen was for his out of shape. No, uh, he probably recognizes that we have some of the same physique. Anyway, so during this trip, I mean, I'm, 
I, I, I was hesitant to say this, but this goes to show how just depleted I was getting. I woke up in the middle of the night one night, and I'm like, what is that smell? I'm like, oh, my gosh. It was almost like this ammonia smell. And I got to looking around and everything, and I'm like, dude, that's me. I mean, it was just pouring out of me. And, and Wednesday, Wednesday of the trip, we got there on a Sunday, and, 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 and Wednesday of the trip, we're working outside in this heat. It's hot. We're working on this building, and, and it, the heat's pounding down. And I've never fainted in my life, okay? Never fainted in my life. Three times on this Wednesday, I go to my knees. I'm just like working, and all of a sudden, I'm just like, poof, find myself on my knees. I'm like, how did I get here? Okay? Dehydration. As a matter of fact, I had poured so many of, of the things that I needed in my body out, okay, I, I had poured so much of that out, the, the electrolytes and stuff. I, water wasn't even doing the trick because I was guzzling water. Just boop, 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 boop. I was just guzzling water. Couldn't keep it in. And I was dehydrated to the point where literally my mind wasn't working right. Uh, I wasn't working right physically. I was weak. I was irritable. Okay? Come to find out, we were walking through the town. We were going to go visit a hospital in the town. There was two guys that were on my six watching me because they thought I was going to faint. I mean, I was just that sick. So I get home, and, and after two weeks of being home, you know, again, I'm just putting this off as, dude, I'm fat and out of shape, and I, I can't take Katie, okay? I get home and find out that I'd been bitten by a mosquito carrying some kind of virus, and I was also sick and had this, like, fever of, of over 100 degrees while it was going on. I just thought I was fat and out of shape, but I was also sick. <laughs> that was true that I was fat and out of shape, but I was also sick. But anyway, point being is that when we're dehydrated, we got to get replenished. Otherwise, our bodies don't work the way they're supposed to, okay? And the same thing is true for our souls. We can easily get depleted. We can easily find ourselves going, what do I do when my soul feels so empty? So let's talk about that today. What do we need to do when our, when our spiritual self whether it's, it's emotionally, relationally, spiritually, when your tank is on E, what do we do? Well, if you're like me, okay, if you're like me, this is what I usually say. I feel myself starting to drift, starting to get empty, emotionally, spiritually, relationally. Here's what I usually say. How many can relate to this? I'll just fix this. I got this. I know what I need to fill my tank back up. And so being an introvert, I really am, I'm an introverted person by nature. I just, I gotta find some me time. <laughs> I just gotta find some downtime, just to, some alone time. Or, you know, for someone like me, I just need another challenge. I gotta find out what that next hill is to climb. I need to find something that I can pour into that I can see that, that is it accomplishing something with, of worth. And so I search out the challenge or or maybe you're the extrovert. You're kind of the opposite of me. And so you're just like, I got to get around some people. If I don't get around some people, I'm going to die here. And so you start getting around other people and trying to find that, that source of fulfillment in your life by, by allowing other people to fill you. And, and sadly enough, there's some of us who look to substances. And what I mean by substances is it, it, it could be either legal or illegal, <laughs> I mean, legal lies, I mean, we can overindulge in food far too often. When I feel empty, you know what I turn to? It's obvious. Pizza. Right? I love pizza. I, I mean, think about this for just a second. I, I, how many of you are like me? You're, you're empty, and so you want to be filled. You want to be feel that satisfaction inside of you. And so what you do is you order a pie that is loaded with some of the goodness of God on top of it. And you get this pie, this pizza in front of you, and if you're like me, you pray quickly, and then you start eating, right? And you're just eating, 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 and one of two things happens every time. Either the pie is gone, and I'm still not satisfied, or I get to a point where I have just completely overindulged and I'm sick. But this is what I know. At some point, the feeling of satisfaction of eating that pie comes and it goes. It's here for a minute and then just gone, right? It's kind of like that bucket list thing. We do it, but then what's next? 
It doesn't completely satisfy. And it's kind, of like, it's kind of like the fulfillment that many people are looking for that go to work Monday through Friday, and they're just working. Remember the old song, working for the weekend? We're working for the weekend. We're working for that Friday night and that Saturday night because we're going to go out and we're going to indulge and we're going to do something that we think is going to fill us up. It's going to satisfy But what happens on Sunday morning or Monday morning. The feeling's gone. And all of a sudden you start working again for the weekend because you've got to find that thing that is going to fill us up. The problem is there are so many things, there are so many things that we can chase after in this life that we think are just going to fill our tanks up, okay? And, and we know this, that they're temporary. And, and, and the constant emptiness and dryness that we find in our lives is just there. And we know this, don't we? Come on, I'm not the only one that struggles with this. Christians in here are like, we should never struggle with that. (laughs) Bull butter. We all struggle with it, right? Because oftentimes we're trying to satisfy a hunger or a thirst that's never going to satisfy unless we know. And Christians, we know this. We know that the true satisfaction from the well of life that The cure for our thirst is found nowhere else than in Jesus Christ. Nowhere else than in Jesus Christ. But it's such a draw. It's such a draw to some of the worldly things that we think are really going to satisfy us. Right? We we look for things that we, we think are going to satisfy us more than Christ. And so we chase after those things of the world instead of the true source of life. And it's an easy trap. It's an easy trap. As a matter of fact, look at 1 John. John's writing this. This isn't anything new. This isn't something that our culture or our society is dealing with and nobody else has had to deal with. Um, But 1 John 2 says this. You're going to see a common word in here. We're We're going to look at this. Do not love this world, nor the things it offers. For when you love the world, you do not, ooh, this is huge, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Now why? Why are we not to love the world? For the world offers only a craving for the physical pleasures, a craving for everything that we see, and and pride in our achievements and possessions. They are not from the Father, but they are from this world. And this world is fading away. It's not going to last. It's leaving, along with Everything that people crave. So all these things that we think are going to satisfy, they may even satisfy you while they're on this earth, but once this earth is gone, it's done. It's over. There's only one eternal thing. So where do we turn for this fulfillment for our souls? But anyone who, who, who does what pleases God will live forever. There's true life-giving, life-breathing life. It comes from God. So some of you may be like, wait, 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 wait. Okay, Tim. So you say we're not supposed to love the world. But one of the most famous passages in the world also comes from John when he says, for God so loved what? Uh Uh-oh. Problem. Mayday, what do we do with this? So is this a contradiction of passage or contradiction of God? He says, number one, that he loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son. But then here John says, do not love the world. If you love the world, you have no God in you. Okay, so how do we reconcile this? Well, here's how we reconcile this. You have to understand, there's, there's different contexts and meanings of different world, words at different times. And this word world is one of those. There are kind of a couple different ideas behind this um, from the Bible's perspective about what the world is. The first part of, of understanding the world is this, is that God created it. God, everything that you see, the physical world that you see that we're living in, God created. The visible things, the physical things created in, for us. And, and let me tell you something. What God created was perfect, right? What God created was perfect. And this includes humanity. As a matter of fact, when he he creates the world, he says everything is good. When he created humanity, he says, ooh, that's very good. So we're his special creation. 
That's the world that God loves. That's, that's what he created. He came for it. He died for this idea of the world. But the second one, the second concept of world, might be better no, uh, laid out with this idea of worldliness. Does that make sense? Worldliness. What is worldliness? It takes on a lot of different nuances, but the key is this. The key, I think, is this. It's how we view life. And how we view life as human beings knowing that we have a sinful nature. Okay? So follow me on this. It's taking the things that God created and he made them perfect. But these things of the world have become distorted by sin. Remember this? In Genesis chapter 3, the fall. And so now the earth is cursed. Human beings are, are full of sin. Okay? And so that's how we many times look at the, the, the world. So a worldly mindset is a mindset that's focused on, on self. It's self-righteous. It's, it's self-indulgence. And, and even though we're self-indulgent on the things of this earth, what happens is when we pursue those, pursue those, pursue those, we still come up empty. Okay? And so the world, we're told not to love. So let's look at this. Why are we not to love the world? Why are we not to love worldliness? So what does it mean when he says don't love the worldly things? Pay, pay attention. We're going we're to dive into this a little bit. So if you've drifted a little bit or if the person you're sitting next to has fallen asleep, now it's time to elbow. It's like, look, at this, this is good, okay? This is what you're paying me for today. The big bucks. Okay. So we all struggle with this. There's not a person in here who doesn't struggle with where we're going to go. So I said there's a common theme in this passage of Scripture. Remember what that common word was? Love. Right? And so this, this idea or the way that this word is in the Greek, okay, translated in the Greek, is this concept of agape love. Okay? That's what this passage is talking about. Agape love. Now, agape love is just a, is, is just a form of love, and, and it's an act of our own will. In other words, this type of love that's talked about in Scripture is a choice type of love. You get to choose what and how or who you're going to love. It's a preference it's a preference type of love. I, I prefer to love this person or that thing over another. It chooses a place of pleasure in something or someone. And so I also call it, if you've ever been to one of my, uh, a, a wedding that I perform for someone, I use this often, that agape love is an even though type of love. It's even though I don't really like you right now, which happens in marriages once in a while, sometimes, often, daily. Anyway, um, even though I don't really like you or what you're doing right now, I choose, I choose to love you. I may not even like the situation that I'm finding myself in, but I choose, I prefer to love you. It's an even though kind of love. Even though this is happening, I choose to love you. As sometimes, can I just tell you this, this agape love many times is not something that you can do on your own. As a matter of fact, I would say this, that, that where the wellspring of this type of love comes from is allowing God to work through you to demonstrate this love. It's preferring, it's allowing, it's choosing God to work through you to love this person. And so preference is the key. Preference is the key to this type of love. We actively choose one thing over another thing. Now, here, it begs this question. Why would we prefer agape, to agape love things of this world? Okay? Even as Christians, how do we slip into this? Worldly things we think are just going to bring that fulfillment, that satisfaction when we're dry in our souls, when we're empty in our souls, when we're running on E. Why is it that many times we agape love or we prefer or we choose to love things of this world when the Bible says these things are going to pass away? 
Am I the only one that falls into this trap? I don't think so. And why is it? Why is it many times that I chase the things of this world instead of pursuing God? Why is it that I choose many times to look at things that are going to fulfill me on this earth that really aren't going to fulfill me, and I know that going into it, and I kind of turn my back on God? Why is it that that happens? Can I just tell you this? The answer is we have a spiritual enemy that is distracting, distracting, distracting us. He's enticing us. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about who our spiritual enemy is. And it's like, he's got a lure. He's got bait in the water. <laughs> and he's putting the lure out. And he's like, look at this sparkly thing over here. And it entices us. And it draws us. And all of a sudden, we're, we're looking at the bait. He's clever, man. He's baiting us. He's distracting us. He's creating what I would call an illusion it's an illusion of life. And we can easily start grasping at this, at this thing, whatever it is that, that, that Satan is dangling in front of us. And, and we know, we kind of know in the back of our minds that this isn't going to bring life, but wow, it's going to bring temporary satisfaction, so I'm going to chase it anyway. It's just an illusion of life. And this illusion means that we're deceived and we're looking at something, believing that it's going to be something so much more than really it is. It's the illusion. It's the trap. It's the bait in the water. It's how our enemy will bait our flesh into saying things that, wow, this is going to bring meaning into your life. This is going to bring purpose, and it can't. And so often it only brings emptiness instead. It brings absolute despair and hopelessness instead. And as believers... When we take the bait, you know what that does to us? It makes us ineffective. It takes us off the path that God has us on. It makes us unproductive, grasping at things. Instead of clinging to our Savior, okay, instead of clinging to the one true source of life, we cling to these other things. We get an illusion because there's something that looks like life, but it isn't life-giving. And here's, one, here's the thing. I said that, th that we're not the only ones that have struggled with this, right? Do you realize that's what took place in the Garden of, of Eden, right? With Adam and Eve? God says you have, it, was, it was created perfect. They were, in, they were in this world that was perfect. There was no sin. There was no weeds. There was none of that stuff happening in, you know, it was perfect. And he says, just leave this one tree alone. Don't touch it. Leave it alone. And then Satan comes along and goes, hey, you want to know the real meaning of life? Go check this out. D did God really say you couldn't have that? You know God loves you. You know he's going to pour his grace upon you, so why not just indulge? It, it can't hurt you that much. And they bit it. <laughs> and it devastated God's heart. You know, there's, there's a cycle the Israelites, God's chosen people, right? They were God's chosen people. But these Israelites continually found themselves in this cycle, okay, where they would pursue something other than God. They would actually literally turn their back on God. They may create an idol of some sort or, or, or just follow someone that they knew they shouldn't be following. And so they sinned in the eyes of God. And so God would oppress them. God would bring, you know, some type of calamity upon his people, in order to get their attention, right? Sometimes he, he put them into bondage, slavery. I mean, big stuff. Something would happen. But at some point, they would return back to God. They would bring this return back to God, and God would bring some form of deliverer to, to lead them out of the oppression they were in. But it all started with them pursuing something that wasn't God. The prophet Jeremiah God spoke to him, and he says, I want you to share this with my people. Now, look at this. I want you to hear the heart of God. Speaking through the prophet Jeremiah. He says this in chapter 2, starting in verse 11. He says this. My people have exchanged their glorious God, okay? They've chosen. They prefer. They've exchanged their relationship with this glorious God for worthless things, for worthless idols. They have they have agape love, okay? They have agape. They have chosen to love something other than the glorious God. 
Now watch the heart of God. The heavens are shocked. I mean, at such things, it, 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 it shrieks back in horror and dismay, says the Lord. You ever read that scripture before? The other translations say that God is appalled. He shudders with great horror. This is, this is a horrific choice to God. In other words, God is saying, here I am. I am the glorious God. I will bring life. You know this. I've given you life. You know where the source of life is. And you're chasing something else. And God says, I can't believe it. What are they doing? Why are they doing this? I mean... They're, they're chasing the illusion of life. God says in verse 13, he says, for my people have done a couple different things. Number one, they've abandoned me. Dude, I'm, I'm, I am the fountain of living water. People have forsaken the, the true living water, the spring of life, and they've turned their back on the source of fulfillment in their life. And here's what they've done. Number two, they've dug themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. Now, understand that God is brokenhearted. It breaks God's heart when he says, I'm giving you, I'm giving you the spring of life. I am the water of life. When you are thirsty, turn to me. And so many people are turning to other things than God. As a matter of fact, they're putting all their fulfillment in one place. They're putting them in cisterns. And the cistern, he says, it isn't even a good cistern. It's a crack cistern. Now, what is a cistern? Some of you are just like, I don't get what a cistern is. Some of you know, right? Cisterns hold water. <laughs> They're just a basin. There's something to hold water. But listen to me. They don't produce water. Right? Water comes from either a well or a spring or something that fills the cistern. But a cistern can't produce water water. And he says, not only that, they're cracked. I mean, this is a great metaphor that God uses here. These cisterns, these stored places, this is the place where you're putting your idolatry. This is your heart. This is what has been taken captive. It's unfaithful and wandered off from what is real. This is not life-giving. You've fallen for an illusion and you have fallen for these false gods and you're off the mark. And how many of us in here today are saying, Tim, these are some really harsh words. I hope they're listening to it. Because this ain't for me. I mean, I, I, I've never, I have never once built a golden calf. I have never whittled an Asherah pole and stuck it up in my front yard. I don't have idols in my life. Tim, you can't be talking about me. There's, I don't have any idols in my life, right? Because we're Christ followers, and so therefore we have no idols but Christ. Unfortunately, if you stick with me, you may think, ooh, I may need to refocus some of my priorities because I think we all need to hear this word because I hope maybe you don't, maybe you don't, but I think so many of us do because we can so easily fall in our culture of wealth. Hear me on this. In our culture of wealth, we are very wealthy, by the way, in the world. In our culture of wealth, we can so be easily distracted from the true life source, which is God, the illusion, the idol. Do you, okay, so think about this for just a second. Let me give you, let me give you a definition of what I'm talking about with idol, uh, idolizing something. The illusion is anything that we're trying to, to fill the need that we have in our life with something other than who Jesus Christ is. Anytime that you're trying to fill your life with something other than Jesus Christ, and that is your most pri preference thing in this world, it's your priority, it's your agape love, it's the thing that you're most focused on that you know that I may have to return to it, return to it, return to it, but if I return to it, it's going to fulfill me. And it's something other than Jesus, that's your idol. And hopefully, for many of us, that's our fulfillment is Jesus. I pray that that's where it's at. I know for some of you it is. 
but the illusion is a counterfeit source instead of the true source of life. And so we go to these substitute containers to fill us. Now, some of you, I may have lost in this, because you're just like, wow, I can't have anything nice in my life. I can't have these good things in my life. I, I, I can't enjoy some of the things in my life. No, I want you to hear me on this. I do want to say that God blesses us with many things in this world. Did you hear me on this? God does bless us with many things in this world. God wants us to take joy in some of the blessings that he gives us in this world. Here's the however. These blessings are never meant to be our source of satisfaction in life. The blessings that we find in this world are blessings from God. Therefore, we don't worship the blessing. We worship the person who gave us the blessing. Anybody with me on this? Think about this. Think about this. Um, I made this up on my, this morning, so this may not go over real well. We'll try it. We try to find sources of blessings. And so we come up with cisterns. We come up with containers. And so sometimes, I just went and just got coffee cups, okay? This is my beer barrel coffee cup. And sometimes we're just looking for satisfaction here, Right? Whatever substance that we can pour into our body that's going to take us away from this life and help us be fulfilled. And, and so we start to fill those things up, right? Maybe, maybe this is the container that, that we're trying to find satisfaction in or what do I have here? Oh, this is my dad's favorite turds cup. It's got all my kids' names on it and little turd emojis. Anyway, so some of us, let's be honest, You've, you've started a family, you've built a family, and you're thinking, man, if I can just find satisfaction in my kids or in my family or in my spouse or whatever, this is what I'm going to pour into. This is where I'm going to try to find satisfaction. But we know even in relationships, because relationships are important, right? God wants us to be in relationship with people. But at some point, those relationships are going to break down. Why? Because you're in it, and you're broken, and they're in it, and they're broken, and so relationships, which are important, are ultimately going to come up empty at some point. Let's see here. What else? Oh, this is my Menards cup. My Menards cup. Why? I love building things. I love tinkering out in my garage. I like doing things. I, I hate rebuilding, by the way. I just like to make stuff. Usually it's not really crafty. It's usually not really good, but I like to do it. Okay? However, if all of our time and effort is into creating and into building and all these different things, you know what's going to happen is, yeah, it's fun for a while and it's doable for a while and it's satisfactory for a little while, but ultimately, again, it's going to come up short. It doesn't totally satisfy. I'm going to wait for that one. Let's pull this one out. Real good dad. A fish on there. I don't know if you can tell. It's anyway, hobbies, vacations, you know, things of this going, 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 keeping busy, the vacations, the homes, all these different things that we can pour into. Those are good things. I think God wants us to enjoy life and be part of life and, and have fun in life. And I think He loves when, when we're able to accomplish those things, whether it's fishing or doing whatever you like. I think God finds joy in the fact that you're finding joy in this life. But if this is all you're living for, at some point, it's a cracked cistern. It comes up empty. It's not the day in, day out. <laughs> Some of you know what this symbol is. Obviously, many of you don't. It's Starbucks. Some of you are like, oh. Status. Their coffee tastes like poo. It's the cup, right? It's the cup, it's the status. It's like, I go in there wearing the shirts that I wear and I'm like, man, I don't have North Face on. I'm not even sure I'm supposed to be in here. Anyway, it's, it's a symbol. 
It's status. It's what you want people to think about who you are, right? Some of us, it's our job. Some of us, it's how we dress. Some of us, it's the car we drive. Some of us, it's, it's the house that we live in. Some of us, is what we look like. Some of you spent hours in front of the mirror this morning just coming to the church because you were going to run into other people because you're worried about your image and what people think of you. It's true. Because status fills you up. And again, that's not necessarily a bad thing, especially when you use your status to draw people closer to Jesus Christ. I think that's a great thing. But if it's all about your status, at some point it's a cracked cistern. I threw one more in here. This is my (laughs) morning cup of coffee. Right? You know this cup of coffee. This cup of coffee is... I need more than I've got right now, right? I can never get enough. Bigger is always better. It may not be quality, but man, it's quantity. Man, I'm gonna fill, 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 fill. I've got the biggest cup around. Now let me just say what this kind of looks like many times. This big cup that's huge, that we keep trying to fill. Does it look like our retirement? Does it look like our bank account? Does it look like us paying off our houses? Does it look, and, and again, I think those things are wise things to do. But when this is everything that you're living for, think about this for just a second. I'm just gonna toss this out here. I've said it before if you've been around the Point Church very long. Wouldn't we all like a, more money? Wouldn't we all like, come on. Be honest in church. You would like more money, right? Somebody tell me you like more money. Thank you. We would all like more money. How much more do you need? Just more than you've got now. Right? Doesn't matter what you're making, we all want just a little bit more than we have now. And again, it's the pursuit of things. It's doing things to help us in the future or even help us right now to accomplish the goals that God has for us. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But if this is where we're trying to find our true life source, it's a cracked cistern. And the truth of the matter is, is this. God gives us these things. God gives us all these things. He allows these things. Now listen, 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 listen. Not all of the cisterns that we have up here are positive and healthy and blessings from God. Hello. Some of them are very destructive and hurtful and harmful, and yet we still chase after those. I should have brought something into this for that. But there's things that we know that we're doing in our lives that are way far away from who God is. And once in our lives. And so we're still chasing after those. Now, again, these things. Let's just say that these things are the blessings that God gives us. And these are good things. Hear, hear me on this. These are blessings from God. But we need to... It's easy for us to seek the gift and not the giver. It's easy for us to look for the gift instead of the giver. We can easily begin to agape love the gift and not the giver. And these blessings of life, they should point us to the one who is worthy, the creator who is forever to be praised. And they are given. Every good and perfect gift comes from God above. But I'm telling you something. These blessings, these gifts are not the prize. The prize is Jesus Christ. The prize is Jesus Christ. The greatest gift that was ever given, the greatest blessing that was ever bestowed upon us, what we have in our lives that is the greatest thing that God has ever given, Jesus Christ, our agape love, our preferred love, our choice to love should always be pointed to Jesus. Always. And here's what I know. Here's God up here going, dude, you're settling for that? Here I am, I want you to have this. This thing will overflow if you just keep coming to me, keep filling yourself out of this right here. This is the spring of life. This is the one that has the well in it. This is the one that has the spring that's overflowing constantly. And so many times we're settling for the blessings instead of the blesser. We're settling for the gift instead of the giver. We're settling for something that is not the prize instead of the prize of Jesus Christ. And God says, 
Look at this. This is what I want you to have. This is why God has taken back so many times when we're settling for the things of life and not settling for him. Listen to me. When you get Jesus Christ, you also get this thing called the Holy Spirit. Isn't this amazing? For us who are Christians, we get this. The Holy Spirit helps us in so many ways to determine what we should be focusing on. When we're not focusing on, on this, when we're not focusing on God, what the Holy Spirit does is says, hey, remember? He convicts us. Remember? Stop focusing on all these things. These are good things, but focus here on me. The Holy Spirit is the one that when we get off track, he will convict us to fill our lives, not with worldly things. The Holy Spirit will speak to us to convict us to come back to Jesus. So what happens? What happens if we get off track? What happens when all of these things become more important than the one thing? The Holy Spirit convicts us. He says, hey, dude, you're, you're, you're way off track. You need to come back. And if we listen to the Holy Spirit, we need to just humbly repent. We need to humbly repent, turn back to God through Jesus Christ. Why? I think we need a good reminder of this once in a while, that our God, our God, our loving, caring, gracious God is also a very jealous God. He's a glory hound. He wants all of your attention. All of your attention. Everything in who you are and what you do, God wants to be part of. And so we, we give him all of our sisters. We give him all of our idolatry. We give him all of our identity. We give him our families. We give him our work. We give him our job. We even give him our resources and say, God, they are yours. Just give them to him. Repent. Turn back to him. And this becomes your only source of life. I would put this in here, but it's got my coffee in it. Turn back to God. We have a jealous God who loves us, and he wants to pour his grace upon us, even when we've settled for everything else. James 4, 7 says this. So humble yourselves. When you get off track... When you start pursuing worldliness, when you start putting idols, when you start putting cisterns in place that aren't me, humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Listen to this. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between where? God and the world. Therefore, we submit to God. Therefore, we resist the devil that is making an illusion of life that many times we're chasing. And we humbly repent. And when you humbly repent, what you're saying is this, that I'm going to refocus my agape love. I choose, I prefer to focus back on God. Not the things of this world. Many of those things are blessings, but they're not the blessed. Many of these things are great gifts, but they're not the giver. <laughs> then we're going to turn to the source of where that comes from, Jesus Christ, and we receive the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit will remind us that we should walk by faith, feasting on the word of God, which is the scriptures. Those are life-giving words found in the Bible, not conforming any longer to the patterns of this world, but becoming being transformed into uh, what God's will is for our lives and the renewing of our minds, reminding us that we live for Christ. We model who Jesus Christ is, becoming more like him. The Holy Spirit reminds us to view people as God views people, not as objects, but of compassion, great compassion and love. People he wants to reconcile back to himself, and he uses people such as you and I, the church, to be his ambassadors the Holy Spirit is going to help us to walk, not in flesh. We're going to be filled with him, and we're going to walk in faith. Here's the deal. It's so easy to walk in this world and come up empty, come up thirsty, come up dry. 
But when you live by the Holy Spirit, I will tell you, you get the contentment of a God who loves you. You're filled with the peace of God instead of irritability. You're filled with the love for people. You're filled with the Holy Spirit that gives you rest. You're filled with hope. And, and, and if you get confused in life, which life is very confusing, the Holy Spirit brings clarity. When you have weaknesses, oh, I don't know about you, but many times the world leaves me weak. <laughs> leaves me spent. With the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, God can bring joy, even in the midst of some of the worst trials and sufferings and hardships of the world. When we live by the Spirit, it's the joy of God that is our strength. Jesus said this. Jesus said this. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be satisfied. Everyone who drinks from Jesus, Jesus says, whoever drinks of the water, which is me, will never thirst again. The water will well up inside of them like a spring of living water, welling up to eternal life. This is, guys, this is the opposite of worldly living. This is godly living. So we live for him. We live for his kingdom. We live for his overflowing of blessings in our lives. Not only on this earth, but eternally. And when we get this, right? When we get this, when we know this, our only reasonable response is, as Christ followers, as ones who have had the Holy Spirit indwell in us, as ones who know that life comes from God and God alone. And when we're seeking Him and not all these other things, our only reasonable response is to worship Him for what He gives. So Point Church, will you stand to your feet? And if you're watching online, I hope that you'll stay with us as we simply worship God. God, we thank you. We thank you for being the living water. We thank you for welling up inside of us through your Holy Spirit. God, we thank you that you are a great giver, that you've given us life through your son, Jesus Christ. God, I pray today that if there are people who have gotten off track, they've been chasing all these things that aren't of you, that aren't of the living water. They've been chasing the illusion that today, Lord, they would just recommit to you. They would just humbly come before you and say, I need your help being drawn back to you. God, your promise is you're right there with us. Thank you, God. Thank you for giving us life. Thank you for giving us the blessing of your son, Jesus Christ, that brings eternal life. Thank you for indwelling us with your Holy Spirit that convicts and guides and strengthens and brings your peace and patience, your provision, your protection. God, it's in that that we worship you. God, it's in that where we are refocusing daily as our wellspring of life. Pray this all in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.
will above all else my purpose remains the art of losing myself in bringing you praise everlasting your light will shine when all else fades ever ending your glory goes beyond I give you control Consume me from the inside out, Lord Let justice and grace Become my embrace To love you from the inside out remains the art of losing myself in bringing you praise everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all fame yeah. my heart and my soul Lord I give you Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and grace become my embrace. To love you from the inside out, everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise be called my embrace to love you for the Jesus, 
Anyway, my name is JC. If you don't know me, I'm one of the pastors here at The Point, and we're really glad to have you here. This is our time that we're going to uh, do communion and uh, join in with one another as a family uh, for this meal that we use to remember what Jesus has done because he has asked us to do this for forever. Um, so in my studies this week, I came across a little tidbit of information that I thought was pretty interesting and important. And, you know, sometimes we go through these things and we, it's like, well, at least I do. And it's something that reinforces something that I either already knew or re-remember, brings back to life something that I had known or just a brand new thing. Um, and I wanted to share this with you. So one question I would have is how much importance do we put on the cross itself? We hear people talk about the cross as important to Christians. And we put that importance on Jesus' death, yes, but how do we transfer all that over to the cross itself? This was kind of cool, I thought. The cross that Jesus died on and God's word concerning his death just show us, I think, should show us, just how dependent we are on that cross. I mean, it wasn't just that it was a horrible and painful death, which it was, and we talk about this quite often during communion. Um, but it was a totally disgraceful way to die as well. So in the Old Testament, God's chosen people, the Jews, knew this very well. Uh, when God's chosen people chose to break the law, they were hung from a tree because it was a symbol of God's utter disapproval and even a curse on that person's afterlife, as I read it. Um, Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 21 says, anyone who is found guilty of breaking the law, uh, sorry about that, anyone who is found guilty of an offense uh, deserving the death penalty is executed and you hang his body from a tree. For anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's girth, under God's curse. Well, it can't get much worse than that, I don't think. I mean, here you are, disgraced in front of crowds of people by being put to death for doing something you did wrong, but also under God's curse. That's the worst. And when it comes to, uh, when, when, I think when we come to understand that death on a cross was probably worse than any other form of death, especially in that day, we can start to see why Jesus had to die in this manner and endure it for us. But he took something that was so vile and disgusting in the way of death and turned it into something that was just so beautiful, which the world itself cannot understand and many times we can't even even fully comprehend as Christians, right? Uh, and he turned it into something so beautiful that now we can praise him for that death that he endured willingly. And this praise that we have for him, I don't think can compare to any praise that we might have on this earth forever. Galatians 3.13 says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming the curse for us because it is written, Anyone who is hung on a tree is cursed. So here's the same scripture in the New Testament. Jesus literally took the curse from God upon himself so that we didn't have to look forward to this kind of a disgusting and shameful and despairing way to die. A one-time gift for release of penalty for anyone who puts their trust in him. Jesus endured this shameful death because of the immense love he has for us immense love so that we could become his brothers and sisters, family in his father, uh, children in his father's family. God's family, even though we see that our families sometimes break down and, and have problems, God's family, it's so strong, the bond that is so strong through him that can never be broken. And Jesus Christ has taken that upon himself to give us that for eternity. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. Uh, we're sometimes in such awe that you have given us your only son to die for us, that we would not be stuck uh, apart from you for eternity. I pray for those, Lord, that don't know you, that they do come to understand and love you and trust you, 
I pray for this uh, communion uh, that we take today that our hearts can be in the right place and that we can grow to love you even better than we have uh, from a day before. Amen.
darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Even when I don't see that you're working, even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working, even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Amen. Right? Do you feel that this morning? Guys, do you feel that this morning? Yes. I know a lot of you do, but I know there are people here that don't. And you know what? I'm going to tell you that that's okay. Those words of that song penetrate me to my soul because I know that my God is all of those things. Guys, if that is not you today, we have men and women in the back right in this corner who can talk to you and talk you through what that looks like don't leave here today without that hope that we have in our Savior. Guys, we have, yeah, men and women in the back, please uh, stop by there on your way out. You could also fill out a communication card if you're not wanting to stop. Um, we have hard copy communication cards in our welcome center here. You can also go to our website, thepointwh.org. The WH is important. <laughs> You'll find a lot of the churches if you don't do that. Um, but join us there. Find, fill out a communication card, especially those online. Um, please take a few minutes to do that. We also have in-house some offering envelopes out in the Welcome Center, too. We have bins in the back. For those of you who came prepared to give today and continue to make the Point Church your home and you give here, thank you. Those funds do so much more than what you see. The lights, even the blinking ones the air conditioning that we so enjoy. God, the, guys, that money just goes beyond these walls into our community and all around the world. So we thank you for that. Um, as you leave today, we mentioned before, we this is our fall kickoff. Please take some time in the foyer today uh, to meet some people and to get connected. Again, if that is not you, if you've been on the fringe for a while, uh, just stop by, look around. No one's going to pressure you. No one's going to tackle you. Well, Sarah might, you know, she's really wanting the, the alternative uh, helpers, but uh, you know, we're not going to do that. We want you plugged in to where you can serve God the best and connect with him the most. So have a great week, guys. We love you. We'll see you next week.